Welcome to this little film about my uh, great grandfather, um, more particularly um, his diary. This is his diary that I keep very safe. His diary from 1916 that he kept while he was on the uh, on the Somme front. I also have his uh, postcard that he sent home in 1915. Um, lovely lace postcard that he sent home from the uh, from the Western Front, and his picture sits up on my wall and get my finger right just there there you go here's great granddad fred never met him died in 1933 but this is a little bit little film about his life and shows you how you can take a historical document like the diary and try and do a bit of research to bring the thing to life hope you enjoy so this is filmed is about frederick john william mitchell there he is there um, and hopefully this will give you an insight into a typical sort of military family in the late 19th and early 20th century. Tell you a bit about life on the Western Front on a day-to-day -day matter and show you how you can use a historical document to bring the past to life. How a historian takes a document and try and work out what the context is and what's going on. So. I have to give you a little bit of background on uh, on Fred, born 1876, joined the Royal Artillery as a young boy, 1890. He stationed late to various places, including Landguard Fort, which is quite near Ipswich, which is why he's got his portrait taken at Ipswich. Landguard Fort becomes important later. Portsmouth, that doesn't become important later. Serves in Hong Kong, Eastbourne and New Haven, um, Dover. Sierra Leone, which was uh, not a very popular posting, and Dover again. Um, and then 1914, obviously, World War One starts, and he's at Great Yarmouth, um, beginning of World War One, where he's involved in a Zeppelin raid. And 1915 is at Fort Ferrum, where they're assembling a unit of artillerymen to go over to France. Let's just step back a year. 1913 this is his gunnery certificate or a copy of it um, they retrained the uh, the artillery what they used to these big guns used to sort of fire um, and used to have big chocks behind the wheels and the wheels rolled back up these chocks and then sort of back into the same position when you fired it again you weren't necessarily going to hit anything in the same direction and they started this quick firing method whereby they had big springs on the gun and the barrel used to bash back and forth and the rest of the gun stayed relatively stable a bit like the suspension on your car and it meant that once you got your gun aligned you could fire again and again and again at the same spot so if you've got an observer watching where the shells are falling they might go you know left a bit right a bit bit further or drop the range a bit and once they got it perfectly on where they're trying to fire at you could just fire again and again and again um, so this is a a method um, and they had to retrain all the artillerymen. World War One kicked off in 1914-1915 he was out and he left for France he'd been on the verge of retirement um, and I'd been out to the site and these are my old photos I've stitched together showing the view um, just over the horizon was where the German lines were and his gun was by those trees in a sort of middle distance next to the road so they're behind a hill so they're sort of hidden from the Germans. He went over as a battery quartermaster sergeant with a 16th siege battery, which is part of, a, along with the 15th part of the 9th heavy artillery brigade, there's about 150 in a battery. So the first 10 siege batteries are regular troops, 11 onwards, like Fred's, reservists, soldiers like him on the brink of retirement. And he's billeted in a small valley to the northwest of this little village in France called Salio Bois. And the guns were just to the southeast of the village. Um, and he was billeted, as I say, on the northwest. And they're bombing the, uh, bombarding the German front line um, around Goncourt and Sir, which is about one and a half miles or two kilometres away. So on the right hand side of the map, you can see the blue line, which is the British and Commonwealth front line. The red line, which is the Germans, and obviously it was no man's land between the two. So Fred's firing at that piece of frontier in front of him. 
is a lovely model I made of um, the howitzers. So, um, not a massive expert on guns, but I think I've got the right pictures here. So, 15 to June 16, they've got these um, 30 um, ton six inch howitzers, and howitzers fire shells high up in the air. They drop at a steep angle and they're good for blowing up um, fortified positions. At the beginning, the, the British and Commonwealth troops have 20 siege howitzers on the Somme front. Um, he's later transferred to the 9th siege battery, um, just as the Battle of Somme is kicking off. Um, they're um, armed with Mark I howitzers, and later in July they get these slightly lighter but better and more efficient howitzers, 26 ton 6 inches. Um, and by the time the uh, Battle of Somme kicks off, there's 104 howitzers, so it's five times as many. By November, he's uh, sent home, and the battery is made up of four guns um, in two sections. So there's two in each section, so he's in a section with two of these howitzers. So the diary. Um, when he arrives um, in that sector, they're operating a live and let live system. By the end of the diary, there's preparations made for the big push, the Battle of the Somme, famous battle. The war diary of the 16th Siege Battery says on um, Christmas Day 1915 that a notice board was placed in front of the enemy trenches to the effect that they were going to range Savy on Christmas Day. What does that mean? Well, basically, a German officer is told that the German artillery, you can have to fire some shells at Saley, and ranging is to make sure the guns are pointing so when they fire, they'll immediately hit the village. So the German soldiers are thinking, well, that's not a nice thing to do on Christmas Day. Better warn the British, and they put a sign up saying, we've been told to fire at you, and so in an apologetic way. Um, it's not quite the truce of Christmas 1914, the famous truce where supposedly they played football in no man's land, but it's you know part of this sort of live and let live system of trying not to uh, um, antagonise the enemy too much. So how did live and let live work? Well, basically, um, you fired when you knew where the enemy were under cover. You went out and, and relayed your barbed wire and moved supplies around in the dark. During the daytime, you generally st stayed under cover. Breakfast, lunch and dinner, you knew where the enemy were because all the smoke rising out of where they were cooking their food. Dawn and dusk, generally, in case there was an attack. Sometimes they stood two in the frontline trenches. So if you bombarded the enemy frontline trenches at dawn, in case there was a dawn attack, you could hit them. But so you were firing at times of the day when you weren't going to hit anyone. But if either side broke these unwritten rules, you retaliated. So if the British shelled the Germans, as this one British soldier says, the Germans replied and the damage was equal. The Germans bombed an advanced piece of trench, killed five Englishmen. Answering fire killed five Germans. Bombed means throwing grenades in all through World War One. So the artillery used to sort of ritualise a fire knowing they couldn't kill anyone. They could cause death if they wanted to. So what you could do is drop a shell on a road. Then you'd get a traffic jam. Five minutes later, solid column of wagons and you could just lengthen the range, shrapnel, all hell breaks loose and kill loads of them. So you knew how to kill the enemy and you deliberately weren't doing it. Occasionally you get these artillery duels where people break the rules. And what we see as the diary goes on, we'll see it going from a live and let live system to um, actually trying to physically kill each other. So what ended? Um, what they used to do was they used to try and fire them to avoid casualties so the enemy wouldn't fire back. But you start getting trench raids being ordered and what trench raids is you go out at night you have a club, you knock an enemy sentry over the head and drag him back to your lines, um, perhaps throw a couple of grenades around if you get caught and, and leg it back, steal some enemy guns. And this called feuds and arguments, and put people sort of on edge. And vendettas grew up as your friend and your colleague and your comrades were injured. So there's also the Germans were attacking British civilians. So they were using boats to shell 
coastal towns, they were dropping bombs from um, airships and they were organising air raids using planes on towns like Dover and, and on London. If you are from there and you're reading about that, it makes you angry and makes you want to retaliate. So let's have a look at some one of the entries in the diary. This is the 2nd of January, so second entry, and this is the hardest one to translate because basically he's drunk and you can see the handwriting on the left hand side is a bit bad. So um, every day he says what the weather's like. Fine in the morning, turn to rain later. Got up 7 a.m., fine morning. 8.30 proceeded to Marrow to draw provisions. He goes to Marrow on the side car of a, of a motorbike. Um, 4 p.m. right back, four letters to read, rather a nuisance to answer. 6 p.m. went and had a drink, arrived back. Cost five francs for nothing. I'm not sure what that means. 8.30, just going to desk to write a letter. 9.20, all safe, just going to write a letter. He's just said that. John had a French cabbage in his mouth. The handwriting there is very poor. I think he's been at the rum. 10 p.m. bed. January 3rd, fine morning. Batteries heavily bombarded the Germans. Heavy far on the left. Germans very quiet. Weather well, still remained fine. 4.30, all quiet. Just going to write a letter. And everyone goes to bed. But bad night's rest disturbed by rats. Just shows how uh, how it's not um, it's not exactly top level camping that they're doing out there. There's dead rats knocking about. So heavy rainstorm, heavy fire on our left. Two airplanes over a Sally and the aircraft guns couldn't reach them. Airplanes over German lines, shrapnel fired over the battery. Our airplanes drove off some Germans. Um, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. heavy bombardment by our, our RT or artillery. 5 p.m. all quiet, let's knock off and go to bed. There's lots of references to planes in Fred's diary. So the Germans fired shrapnel, which exploded. And so 11 o'clock, they bombard. This is this thing, if you break the rules, you get fired back at. And we can match the references to planes to um, the Royal Flying Corps records. So that it seems that the British planes were the B2C in this um, on this day. And the B2C can be seen at the bottom left there stable nice stable plane good for spotting terrible for aerial combat and the german was a fokker now the fokkers that's a monoplane and the germans had an interrupting gear so they could fire their machine gun through the propeller without blowing the propeller off and it made the german planes um rather dangerous and sort of better than the um british planes so drive them off uh, was a was a good thing 6 p.m. and do all day, bit rough. Um, troops turned in at 9 p.m. 9.30, our battery opened fire. 12 noon finished. This is going to have no effect. Um, then the heavy batteries start bombarding. 2 p.m. finish. All quiet remainder of the day. You're not going to hear anyone. Everyone's going to be undercover during these times. 9.30 to 12, everyone stops for lunch. 1.30 to 2, firing. Partly it might be a shell shortage, but it's just they, this is a live and let live system. This is a pretending to fight. 12th of January, 3 a.m., heavy explosions on our left. That's quite rare. This is happening in the dark. 7 a.m., two of our aeroplanes drop bombs on the German frontline trenches. So 8 a.m., the Germans are shelling our two planes. They fire 300 rounds, never hit them. 9 a.m., the planes return safe. Ten, five planes over German trenches. Noon, our field batteries firing on the Germans. 12.30, all return safe. Turning cold. 4.45, planes flying over the Germans, but their aim is very bad. So these planes, are, it's, it's a new part of warfare and he's very interested in it and he's writing it down all the time. 18th of January. 6 a.m. heavy firing still continues. Now this firing very early in the morning is quite dangerous because people might be out and about or getting breakfast and so forth. 9 a.m. ceases. 11 a.m. our battery open fire on the German trenches. Germans replied by light guns but the shells drop short. 19th of January. He tells us that 12 months ago that day he was bombed at Great Yarmouth by Zeppelins. So this is uh, quite a significant event. 
The German Navy had bombed Great Yarmouth in August before Fred arrived, but on the night, the 19th, 20th of January 1915, Germans um, did their first airship raid over Britain. Now remember, this is in wars previously, modern European wars, armies met each other in a field and fought it out. Deliberately targeting towns and blowing up civilians it was illegal then, it's illegal now. Um, and I've seen history being taught in the uh, in the classrooms in Britain and everyone said, oh, there's, you know, British stories of Germans attacking civilians is, is propaganda. And there is a lot of propaganda and a lot of rubbish um, put out by the British government in World War One. But it is entirely true that this is the first war where civilians are, are attacked and it's German high command that do it. They are getting big cannons and firing shells at Paris. They are launching airship raids on towns. They are getting their boats and going up and bombarding Great Yarmouth and Scarborough and Whitby and Hartlepool. Uh, so they are attacking non-military targets. And this is this is unique. The first time it happens in the German high command. There isn't a war crimes trial with them on trial at the end of the war. So 8.25 p.m. on the 24th of January, our field artillery sent over some shells and the Germans retaliate. This is breaking the rules. So the British sent over four shells, the Germans send over 20, as if to say, do not do that. That time of night, you could hurt people. Night again, greatly disturbed by rats. So, trench raids start, and this is an account of a German trench raid on the British. So, heavy bombardment by the Germans, and our field artillery responded immediately, last till 3 a.m. Um, and to the batteries to see if it was all right, no shells went near. The Germans bombed, meaning hand grenaded, our trenches, killed two and wounded five, took away a Lewis gun, which is a big machine gun, and several rifles, and the 90th Warwick Regiment apparently were all asleep. 8.15, Eight German planes over our billets dropped bombs. Our guns of the 4th Division firing at the Germans and our heavy artillery opened up. When she, uh, as the Germans hit one of our planes and he landed safely behind our billet. Now, um, I think it's a DH-2 um, and there's a picture of me standing next to a DH-2. This is a pusher plane where the British hadn't got the technology to fire the machine gun through the propellers. So they have the propeller at the back of the fuselage. Um, and the gun at the front. Um, they're not as good as the Fokkers, but if you have enough of them, then you're all right. 26th of January, just read in the paper, there was an air raid over Dover. Remember, his family all live in Dover. And there's, I went through the Dover Chronicle um, once, and there are letters written by artillerymen serving in France who are from Dover, writing to the Dover paper saying, when we hear of an air raid over Dover, we are firing more shells. 29th of January, gas attack German by the Germans um, all over. Just being warned that the Warwick's are going to attack the Germans tonight with bombs. So gas attack and Fred suffered throughout um, the rest of his life with very bad lungs. So German trench raids, attacks on his hometown, use of gas. This sector where he was, was live and let live, now ain't. It is now a hostile, hot sector. Heavy bombardment by light artillery, then the Warwick's got through. But owing to the thick fog, they couldn't do anything. So they all came back, no casualties. So the newspapers it exaggerates a bit, saying three of our patrols successfully bombed German trenches near Sierra, and a hostile patrol, which was accounted, was driven off. Fred says there was fog, they couldn't do anything. They all came home. Now we know um, where this uh, trench raid was going to be observed from because in the battery diary not Fred's but the official one written for his unit that he's in they give the map reference to the forward observation post this is where the forward observation officer would observe the fall of the shells because from where Fred's guns they're behind the slope of a little hill they wouldn't be able to see the German trenches so you've got someone further forward tele telephone on a long cable watching where the shells fall and the battery diary says the forward observation officer observes this trench raid from that position and when I went there looked at the map reference there is a little pillbox so I wonder if that was 
where they where the guy sat within this pillbox, which is exactly on that map reference. It's some looking some odd reference. One day he talks about having a cold. They're basically camping in the middle of winter. Um, there's a reference to a sergeant major of the Berkshire Regiment having his leg shot off. It's um, I looked it up. It's Company Sergeant Major Lawrenson. 16th of February. Um, he talks about. I've just heard of the loss of the Arthusa in the North Sea. Um, the Arthusa struck a mine um, four days earlier, and it, it sunk. It's a British warship, part of the sort of the Home Waters Patrol, um, and it sunk in a stretch of water near Langard Fort, where Fred had been stationed. And I think Fred would have seen the irony of the British Centre for sort of like mine warfare was based there and there was a minefield observation tower um, which uh, had unsuccessfully spotted the mine that, that the Arth user hit and sunk. So a bit of irony there, hit a mine where the British are practicing and developing their own mines. Other odd reference, German aeroplane flying over the billets and dropping bombs. 24th February, goes to see the Royal Artillery Band play at Corsairs this afternoon. So he did get a bit of relaxation. 25th of February, blizzard. 20th of March, nearly hit by shrapnel. Shrapnel is bits of metal where they've got shells that are designed to fall, blow apart when they blow up. 11 a.m. Germans replied, but all shells fell on the plane onto a dummy battery. German airplane came um, and dropped a bomb, killing a woman and artillery man and wounded three soldiers. Um, our aircraft guns brought down the airplane and both pilot and observer was killed. So there's dummy batteries, there's pretend batteries. And the idea is that from the air, the Germans will think it's a real set of guns and start firing and wasting shells on that. And there's um, looks like there's a woman in, in the village, whether she's a nurse or whether she um, lives there, I don't know. Wind very gusty, difficult for our airplanes to get about. Remember, these are quite flimsy machines. Another reference to a trench raid. Um, 23rd of March, our artillery started very heavy bombardment. Our infantry territories went across the German trenches, bombed them out. Casualties very slight and we captured some Germans. And this is also mentioned in the uh, in the newspapers. Our troops carried out two successful raids against the enemy trenches. One prisoner captured and three dugouts full of Germans bombarded and blown in. The diary sort of peters out. It doesn't keep it for a whole year. So these are some of the final entries. It becomes quite scattered, the entries. So there's days where he doesn't write anything. 9th of April. Bombardier Williams, Gunnar Atkinson and Budgeon um, seriously wounded by a German 5.9 inch shell bursting over their billet. 27th of May, Germans heavily bombarded us, had a very narrow escape from a German shell. 28th of May, 11pm, Germans got up to our trenches and tried to bomb infantry but failed. We heavily bombarded them. So these are the last entries up to the 28th of May. This is a few pages missing um, from late December and then you go into the bit at the back of the diary you can write notes the memoranda and it starts with this line the whole of the battery suggesting that it written other stuff and we've lost those pages so what the whole of the battery I don't know and it gives some um, it sort of summarizes some later events you keep saying March when it needs eight means April and I've checked against other documents it's definitely April because he was writing his diary on the 7th of March um, 12 non-commissioned officers and men arrived from the left aft battery to dig in new gun pits. Men of the West Yorkshire Regiment helping dig new gun emplacements. As the, the officer in charge of his battery changes to a Captain Forbes. German aeroplane dropped about 30 yards from my tent. tent. Two bombs pieces fell over my tent. This is the first time I realised that his billet's not a dugout, it's not a hut. Um, it's not an old farm building. He's in a tent. He says, here, I'm in a tent. 20th of May, number one gun emplacement finished and gun ready for action. So they're building new gun emplacements. And this is all part of the build up to the Battle of the Somme. 24th of June, bombardment commenced. 
by this point, Fred had been transferred a little bit um, further south. He's right during his, the writing of his diary. He's at the sort of northern end of the um, Somme front where the battle happened, and he gets transferred right to the other end. About the Somme, he doesn't write his diary. There's no battery diary surviving, so I had to piece it together from other diaries of the entire artillery unit, what was happening. So it starts on the 1st of July. Um, Fred had been uh, stationed with the 16th. Um, where he'd been stationed, the British had been um, repulsed. Fred's new unit, um, the 9th Siege Battery, was stationed just northwest of a little village called Suzanne right on the edge of the British and French sectors. So in a lot of the documents I was looking at, um, there was French documents in that ended up in, in all the paperwork related to the, um, the larger artillery unit he was in. In this sector, the French did much better than the British did. Um, and the British in this area did better where they were joined with the uh, next to the French units than further north. And they captured a couple of villages on the opening day. His unit got slowly moved forward. Um, bottom right is where they were originally um, stationed near Suzanne. Um, he gets he moves forward to New Maricor and eventually to the east side of Tronswood, um, where the photograph on the bottom left was taken. He gets involved in the shelling of Gillamore, High Wood, and the attacks at Flair, where um, the attack was first used in war. By mid-November, the um, battle was petering out and Fred sent home to train new artillerymen. So this is a map. Um, the Allies are on the left, so you've got the British and Commonwealth top left, French bottom left, and the Germans on the right. So Fred gets transferred south to um, Suzanne with the 9th Siege Battery and that little red circle there right on the edge of the British and French sectors. So in the run up, occasionally he's shelling um, German positions that are opposite French troops and sometimes he's shelling um, German positions which are opposite British troops. Further north where he had been round Saley, um, the attacks there on the opening day of the Somme were repulsed and the British suffered massive losses. The French did quite well on the opening days. Their troops were more experienced. They, um, I don't think the Germans were expecting them to attack down there. And um, so whilst the Battle of the Somme is thought of in British history of being this terrible disaster, um, the, the French troops did, did had a fairly good opening day. His unit was eventually moved forward because where he was um, firing at, um, a place like Mamets and Montebon, the, uh, the British did have some initial quite good successes and they so they carried on after the first day of the Somme trying to exploit these successes. So eventually his batteries moved further forward and then moved a second time. Little footnote, it's not a major part of the Battle of the Somme, but there was a cavalry attack. Now, everyone always traditionally thinks of um, British soldiers as being very um, British, but it's British and Commonwealth troops. And so you've got to remember that these are troops from across the British Empire. So you've got Canadians and South Africans, Australians, New Zealanders and Indians, like this cavalry unit here. Now, lots of the traditional view of World War One is, you know, the British officers are um, stupid idiots. They're all ex-cavalrymen and they have no idea about the new mechanised warfare with tanks. Well, they're not going to know about mechanised warfare with tanks because there have been tanks before. Um, and I think some of this, the criticism is, has been a bit simplistic and sometimes a bit unfair. There was a cavalry attack and I've read really good um, British authors talking about um, the Battle of the Somme saying there was no cavalry attacks. There was. Um, British unit advanced near High Wood. There were some Germans hiding in a cornfield and they managed to get behind them. Now British planes spotted them and started machine gunning the Germans and the cavalry were thinking why, is, why are they machine gunning that cornfield? Um, and they machine gunned the Germans to the Germans started firing back and at this point the cavalry suddenly went hang on a minute <laughs> there's, there's Germans in that field. And two units, the 7th Dragoon and the 20th Deccan, wheeled round and charged the Germans. Um, 
Deccan um, plateaus in India, they're Indian cavalrymen. So that's why there's a picture there of um, those Indian cavalrymen who on the one little bit on one minor sort of incident on the Battle of the Somme did a cavalry charge and successfully saved the day. The trouble is with the Somme is the um, like all bits of the Western Front, it was really difficult getting the cavalry up. So every time you look like you made a breakthrough, by the time you got the cavalry up, the enemy had blocked the gap. They'd been there earlier, perhaps they could have taken high wood and there was horrendous fighting to take high wood, which had uh, been a shame. But later in the war, late 1918, when it became a war movement, um, the British used cavalry a lot and night tanks and the whippet tanks and the French, the Renault F. T-17 and they were using sort of very sort of swift armoured warfare driving the Germans back. There was a myth that the Germans just gave up. No, they were being pushed back. Um, you know, sort of mobile warfare with, you know, plane attacks and light tanks going through. Now, the Battle of the Somme is, is a sort of stayed on sort of British military history and it's a very raw nerve, the losses. Why were the losses so bad at the Somme? Um, there was a lack of communication. Soon as those troops left those frontline trenches and moved forward, they became lost to the officers. They had no command. They tried laying cables with the telephone wires and all the telephones in those days needed wires. Um, all those wires got um, blown up. Um, luckily, um, when it was realised that these troops were being held up or being massacred, quite junior officers would go, no, we're not going to send anyone further forward because there's a massacre. This is, when I started reading these in documents um, from the uh, Battle of Somme, I, I was quite surprised with this because my I've been taught this thing of the British generals just didn't care and were just sending their troops off to be massacred. This wasn't, didn't seem to be the case. What was happening was the, um, the the officers, the, the rank of say captain, were going, no, no, let's stop this attack. When you looked up the careers of these officers, it didn't affect their career at all. It was the right thing to do, stop the attack when they realised they were being massacred. Often, though, it was a bit too late and the first couple of waves of British attacks had gone forward and they'd all been killed. The French troops were more experienced. Um, they advanced in small rushes rather than in long lines of breast walking against um, machine guns. The British troops weren't considered experienced enough to do this. The French also had learned from the Battle of uh, around Verdun that you needed far more shells to take out a German um, strong point than the British had thought. Um, and it may be one of the reasons why the British did well when in the area next to the French front line was because they were working with the French artillery and had learned some of these lessons that the uh, that you needed to fire more shells um, by heavier guns more accurately to hit the German and wipe out the German deep bunkers. Otherwise, as soon as the um, shelling stops, the Germans go out with the machine guns and just mows down your advancing infantry. It's often thought of um, the Somme as just stupid British generals, but the German generals didn't exactly cover themselves a glory art either. They kept doing pointless counterattacks, and these pointless counterattacks were a trench is a hole in the ground. You lose that hole in the ground. You have a, a middle line, a reserve line, you just retreat back to your reserve line. So all the enemies captured is a hole in the ground. The Germans kept doing these counterattacks, which were entirely pointless. So the British would plan a, an attack but the Germans would, in the afternoon, do this ad hoc counterattack that caused them massive losses. They were on the defensive. The British had horrendous losses on the first day of the Somme. At the end of the battle, the losses, the British losses should have been much, much higher than the German ones, and they weren't because these constant pointless counterattacks by German generals who should have just gone, well, all they've captured is a hole in the ground and suffered loads of casualties. The British generals did drag on the battle. There was some um, quite good gains um, in the south, opposite where Fred was, um, at Memmets and Montauban, and they tried to exploit them and just drag the battle on. There's no strategic 
purpose there there's they're not making a breakthrough it's just like oh the front is moving so let's just keep going on and dragged on into november into the mud and it just led to further death and suffering so these are all the reasons why there were so many casualties and so many losses on the opening day marching line abreast at walking place against machine guns was never going to uh, never going to end well what happened in Fred's later life? There's Fred um, holding my uh, Uncle Ken as a little boy. Um, in the January Islanders, you got the Distinguished Conduct Medal. The Distinguished Conduct Medal you get for just great, good service. It, it doesn't, you know, it's not from a specific action. Um, 1919, um, he gets discharged. He works at various places. He works as an army pay officer because he's a trusted person. Once he's left the army, also as an armaments officer, and this is a, a job looking after the explosives in a, in a big battery, a Langard um, battery, which is uh, just the east of Dover Castle. Um, I think there's a cafe there and uh, the heliport for the Coast Guard is now based there. Now, the thing is, you don't want your armaments officer to be part of the army structure because they're talk to obey so if you're given a stupid order by someone that would put your your uh, risk of the explosives all blowing up causing a terrible accident you'd feel obliged to obey now you get someone that's no longer in the army but understands about explosives so they won't feel pressured to obey an order that would put them at risk which is why ex um, artillerymen like fred would become armaments officers so they're partly independent they'll go in and just say no that's not being stored safely or you've made sure you've got to do that um, free from the pressure of the hierarchy of the army command died 1933 just 57 um, apparently his lungs never really recovered from the gas attacks on the western front um, and he's buried in st james's cemetery in dover and that's his grave Thanks for listening to this uh, little film. Hope you find it enjoyable and a bit educational. Like and subscribe.